VOA won the hits. Roddy Rich with the box. We also heard Lauren Daigle, You Say, and DJ Khaled with Beyonce shining. My name is Nikki Strong. Thanks for rolling with me on VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Alice Bryant. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, the United States, Britain, and Canada have accused Russia of trying to steal Western research into coronavirus vaccines and treatments. In a joint statement, the three governments said Thursday the hacking operation started in February and has continued since. They identified the Russian hacking group APT29, also known as Cozy Bear, as being behind the attacks. Ann Neuberger is Cybersecurity Director at the U.S. National Security Agency. She said, APT-29 has a long history of targeting governmental, diplomatic, think tank, healthcare, and energy organizations for intelligence gain, so we encourage everyone to take this threat seriously. British Foreign Secretary Dominic Robb added, It is completely unacceptable that the Russian intelligence services are targeting those working to combat the coronavirus pandemic. Russian President Vladimir Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, rejected the accusation, saying, Russia has nothing to do with those attempts. He added, we don't have information about who may have hacked pharmaceutical companies and research centers in Britain. Cozy Bear and another group called Fancy Bear were accused by U.S. intelligence officials of hacking into the U.S. Democratic Party email server. Russia denied any involvement in the incident which took place during the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The three Western allies first warned in May that state-backed hackers were trying to steal coronavirus research. But at the time, they did not identify who was behind the attack. The announcement came from Britain's National Cyber Security Center, the Canadian Communication Security Establishment, and the National Security Agency. The coordinated move seemed designed to add more weight and gravity to the accusation, hopefully leading targets of the hackers to take protective action. As COVID-19 spreads to more than 180 countries and territories, Efforts to create an effective vaccine and treatment have expanded worldwide. Johns Hopkins University's Coronavirus Resource Center estimates that, as of July 16, COVID-19 has infected more than 13 million people and killed 580,000. The World Health Organization has listed several human trials in Britain, and the United States among the most promising candidates to produce an effective vaccine. These include major development programs by the companies AstraZeneca and Moderna. Russian officials, however, have said the country's own vaccine is far more developed. Russia has claimed it could be the first country to start giving vaccines to people. U.S. officials have also accused China of trying to steal vaccine research. 
Federal Bureau of Investigation Director Chris Wray said last week, at this very moment, China is working to compromise American healthcare organizations, pharmaceutical companies, and academic institutions conducting essential COVID-19 research. Mike Chappell is an information technology expert at the University of Notre Dame. He said, it's reasonable to conclude that the coronavirus is the number one priority of every intelligence agency around the world right now. American users of the popular video sharing service TikTok are preparing for a possible ban of the app by the U.S. government. U.S. lawmakers have warned the Chinese-owned TikTok could be misusing private user information. They have also expressed concerns about laws requiring Chinese companies to share data requested by the Chinese government. China's ByteDance owns TikTok. The app is hugely popular in the United States and many other countries, especially among young people. TikTok only operates outside of mainland China, and ByteDance runs a similar video sharing service for inside China. The service lets users create and share very short videos and provides helpful tools to do so. Videos often include popular songs from well-known artists and TikTok has helped launch the careers of new internet and music stars. Last week, U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo said officials were looking at banning TikTok. When asked whether he would suggest that Americans use the app, Pompeo told the broadcaster Fox News, only if you want your private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. ByteDance has denied the company is influenced by Chinese officials and says it does not provide any user data to the government. News of the warning spread quickly among TikTok users. One of those users is 20-year-old Ty Gibson of Greensboro, North Carolina. Gibson said at first he dismissed the reports suggesting the app might be banned, but then a technical problem led him to believe a ban might be beginning. The problem, which was later fixed, made a video counting tool disappear. I thought it was the end, Gibson told Reuters news agency. I didn't even have time to think things through. Gibson said he recorded a personal goodbye video for his 4.6 million fans, asking them to follow him on YouTube and Facebook's Instagram. Another well-known TikTok user is professional gaming star Tyler Blevins, more widely known as Ninja. He has 4 million followers on TikTok. After recent reports about a possible ban, Blevins told his 6 million Twitter followers he had already removed TikTok from his phone. Other TikTok fans are staying with the service for now, but some have expressed sadness through videos of themselves crying and dancing while including hashtags about a possible ban. Hashtag TikTok ban 
has received more than 212 million views on the app, while hashtag SaveTikTok got over 315 million. Competing video sharing services like Triller, Byte, and Dubsmash have watched downloads of their apps rise after Pompeo's comments. Some are now directly targeting TikTok users. Triller, which became known for its heavy use of hip-hop music, is seeking to sign up TikTok stars to join, said Ryan Kavanaugh, founder of Triller operator Proxima Media. Taylor Cassidy, a TikTok influencer with 1.7 million followers, told Reuters some TikTok competitors had already contacted her and suggested she build up her presence on their apps. Dylan Tate is an 18-year-old TikTok user from Greenville, South Carolina, with 1.2 million followers. He has been urging other TikTok users to move to the Byte app in his recent videos. Tate says one big reason to move is that Byte gives 100% of ad earnings to video creators. I've been commenting on people's TikToks to tell them to go to Byte. Now people are doing it themselves, he told Reuters. I'm Brian Lynn. Do you ever get annoyed about something that a person does or says often? More than likely, the answer is yes. We are all human, after all. As we spend long periods at home, for example, some of our loved ones' behaviors might become annoying. Maybe you wish they would give you more space or privacy, for example. Or maybe they make too much noise, use your belongings, or rarely do their share of cleaning. Listen to a short exchange between friends. How are things going at home? Mostly fine, but my brother is getting on my nerves. He is constantly leaving dirty clothes in the bathroom, and he's always hogging the computer. The speaker used present continuous verbs to show that these things happen often and that she finds them annoying. On today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore a few forms English speakers use to talk about the present and the past. Let's first discuss the present and stay with the present continuous. Sometimes, English speakers use the present continuous verb form to express annoyance or complain about a repeated action or habit. Alone, this verb form does not express negative emotion. It must be used with adverbs that mean all the time, such as always, constantly, or continually. Let's listen to part of the earlier exchange again. This time, listen for the verbs and notice where the speaker puts the adverbs. As a reminder, the present continuous verb tense is formed with is or are plus a verb ending in ing. He is constantly leaving dirty clothes in the bathroom, and he's always hogging the computer. Did you find the verbs? They are, is leaving, and is hogging. And the speaker put the adverbs in between the verbs, such as in the phrase, is constantly leaving. Another way we casually complain about present behavior is with the form wish plus would. Listen to a speaker talk about a current problem. I wish you would take your health seriously. 
You have not visited the doctor in over a year. For some English speakers, the wish plus would sentence structure may be a little difficult because it contains a noun clause. You can learn more about wish clauses in earlier everyday grammar programs. Note that we can use the form wish plus would in positive sentences with would or negative sentences with wouldn't to express the same basic meaning. Here's an example. I wish you wouldn't ignore your health. You have not visited the doctor in over a year. Now let's talk about ways English speakers express annoyance about past behavior. We can use a continuous tense, this time the past continuous, to say that something aggravating happened often in the past. Suppose the girl who lives with her brother moved to some other place. So she was able to talk about her annoyance as a past problem. Listen for the verbs in the next example. As a reminder, the past continuous verb tense is formed with was or were plus a verb ending in ing. He was constantly leaving dirty clothes in the bathroom. And he was always hogging the computer. Did you find the verbs? They are was leaving and was hogging. Again, with this verb tense, adverbs like always and constantly are needed to express a negative emotion about repeated behavior. Finally, we move to the past form, kept plus gerund. As a reminder, a gerund is a noun ending in ing. You may remember an earlier everyday grammar program that talked about keep plus gerund, which has a few uses, such as to express that something happens again and again. For today's program, let's focus on kept plus gerund for expressing annoyance at a repeated past action. Listen to an example and pay attention for the form kept plus gerund. Our dog kept chewing on everything. He was becoming a real nuisance until we brought in a behavioral specialist. Did you find the form kept plus gerund? The gerund here is chewing. Kept plus gerund has a similar meaning to the past continuous when expressing annoyance or aggravation about a past problem. And we sometimes explain how we solved whatever problem we were facing. Well, that's our program for today. Join us again soon for another lesson on grammar for everyday speaking and writing. I'm Alice Bryant. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Benjamin Harrison. His family name may sound familiar. That is because he was the grandson of President William Henry Harrison. That situation is unique in U.S. history so far. Harrison played an unusually active role as president at a time when most chief executives saw themselves as simply administrators. As a result, American writer and intellectual Henry Adams said, Harrison was the best president since Lincoln. But most Americans remember little about him except his connection to the previous President Harrison, who himself died after only a month in office. (music) 
Benjamin Harrison grew up on a farm in the Midwestern state of Ohio as one of eight children. His grandfather was not the only famous political Harrison. His great-grandfather signed the Declaration of Independence, and his father had been a congressman. Young Benjamin Harrison respected these men and believed he had a role to play in history, too. He received a good education, and even outside of school, he read many books. His hard work and intelligence carried him to Miami University in Ohio and then to a career as a lawyer. Along the way, he married a woman he had known since he was a teenager, Carolyn Lavinia Scott. The couple settled in another Midwestern city, Indianapolis, Indiana, and had a son and daughter. Over time, Harrison steadily built a career as a public official. But his political path was interrupted by the American Civil War. Harrison rose to the rank of general in the Union Army. He fought under General William T. Sherman and was one of the first soldiers to enter Atlanta, Georgia, after the city surrendered. Reports say that Harrison was an excellent soldier, but he did not enjoy fighting or find war romantic. After the war, he returned home to Indiana and continued his legal and political career. In 1881, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. But six years later, he lost his seat when Democrats came to power in his state. Harrison's loss of his Senate seat soon turned to a victory. The Republican Party nominated him as their candidate to run against Grover Cleveland in the 1888 presidential election. Cleveland's economic policies had become unpopular, and Republicans worked hard to support their candidate. They succeeded. Although Cleveland won the popular vote, Harrison won the Electoral College. In 1889, he followed his grandfather's footsteps all the way to the White House. Harrison's election was a major victory for his Republican Party. In addition to winning the White House, Republicans gained seats in the House of Representatives, held a majority in the Senate, and appointed several Republican justices to the Supreme Court. Harrison and other Republican lawmakers used their power to take action on issues at home and internationally. One act was to preserve forests. Harrison identified 17 protected natural areas and helped create Yosemite National Park in California. His government also established Ellis Island in New York to make immigration to the U.S. a more orderly process. Internationally, Harrison's administration sought to build ties with Latin American countries. His government established what would, in time, become the Organization of American States. His administration also increased the United States' global trade, as well as the country's navy. But, for the most part, the most pressing issues of the day were economic. The federal government at that time had an unusually large surplus. Some argued that the surplus was hurting business. In answer, Harrison's government placed a high protective tariff on imported goods. The legislation was known as the McKinley Tariff of 1890. Officials also aimed to limit the power of large corporations to control important markets in the U.S. Finally, they agreed to require the government to buy silver to use as currency. These actions pleased some of his supporters, but they may have contributed 
to the severe economic depression that followed Harrison's term. And in general, voters disapproved of the amount of money Republican lawmakers were spending. Although the country was at peace, the 51st Congress appropriated $1 billion. At the midterm elections, many lawmakers paid for all the spending with their seats. Two years later, voters turned Harrison out of the White House, too. They returned Grover Cleveland to the presidency. Harrison did not express much disappointment. He had worked hard to become president like his grandfather, but he found he did not like being the chief executive. He said, when he left the White House, it was like being released from prison. Among U.S. presidents, Harrison does not have one of the most dramatic biographies. The facts of his life show an intelligent, disciplined man who tried to live by his beliefs. But he was not considered passionate about many things, except perhaps his enjoyment of nature. And he did not have an easy way with people. Even his staff called him the human iceberg, because he could be aloof and act coldly toward people. Yet Harrison's family brought some warmth to his administration. His wife, Carolyn, was known to be a lively social person. She was the first to install a Christmas tree in the White House. Some of Harrison's grandchildren also lived in the White House. Harrison permitted them to play on the grounds with their pet animals. During Harrison's term, the family kept a goat, which the children called Old Whiskers. Harrison's time in the White House saw sorrow, too. Toward the end of her husband's term, the First Lady became seriously ill with tuberculosis. For months, Benjamin Harrison divided his attention between his wife and his job, and yet in the end lost both. After his term as president ended, Harrison returned to his home in Indianapolis. He did some work as a teacher and lawyer and kept a good public image in his community. He also remarried. His second wife was a widow herself, as well as his first wife's niece. He and Mary Scott Lord Dimmick Harrison had a daughter together. The child was only four when Harrison died from pneumonia at age 67. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.